Hello and happy Friday. My name is Isan Taylor with I Love the Berg and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the city of St. Petersburg. We'll get started in just a few minutes with today's host, Peter Belmont from Preserve the Berg, live in Driftwood and Monica Kyle will be running our slideshow today. If you have any questions during our live tour, please feel free to use the comments section if you're watching us on Facebook or the Q&A if you're joining us via Zoom. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible during our live tour. Today, you'll be seeing a mix of live footage and slides with some fantastic historic photos. Um, just as a heads up, this neighborhood is so secluded and dreamy that some of our live footage cell service, it might be spotty in a couple places. Thank you for bearing with, with us. Once again, thank you for joining us today for our History Half Hour. Be sure to follow I Love the Berg on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as making sure you subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next History Half Hour, the latest news and all things good in the Berg. And with that, Peter, I'm gonna let you start us off. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody. And again, my name is Peter Belmont. I'm with Preserve the Berg. I'm excited to lead you through a bit of one of our special neighborhoods here in St. Petersburg today. Uh, just to give you a little kind of heads up about what we're going to do, we're lucky enough that we're going to go into one of the original Driftwood homes. And so just a minute or two, we'll have a chance to see what makes not just the neighborhood special, but what makes the individually designed homes within Driftwood special. Again, a big thanks to uh, I Love the Berg and to the city of St. Pete for making these tours happen. And so let's find out about Driftwood. First of all, uh, there's a great answer to where is Driftwood? And that answer is it's by the Chataway. So hopefully lots of you have been to the Chataway on the corner of 22nd Avenue South and 4th Street. And Driftwood is just a few blocks away uh, facing the waterfront. Driftwood, as far as our present day neighborhood, dates to 1936. And in 1936, the property was bought by Arthur Modine. Um, and if those of you who kind of can think back on our country's history, there was not a lot of construction happening in the 30s. Uh, we had the depression in the 1920s, the late 1920s, St. Petersburg with its history of boom and bust. Um, was very slow to recover. Um, and so Driftwood is one of the few areas of development that happens in the early to mid 1930s. It was also unusual in terms of the development because it was an entire neighborhood that was bought in terms of the piece of land. And um, Arthur Modine had a dream that he put into place and he did so by hiring and retaining an artist. His name was uh, Dodd, uh, Mark Dixon Dodd. And Dodd was essentially the designer for the neighborhood. It's an early example of designing with nature. This is an oak hammock on the waterfront, heavily vegetated. And uh, Arthur Modine wanted that to be part of this neighborhood. So Mark Dixon Dodd, then along with architect Archie Parrish, began the neighborhood design. Uh, it uh, was the idea of having homes secluded within this lush oak hammock and landscaping. Each home was individually designed. There were 19 homes to start with. So let's walk up and see one of those homes. And this was actually the home that uh, Mark Dixon Dodd did live in for a number of years. As we, walk up the front, as we walk up the front walkway, we are uh, walking on hex blocks. Uh, our historic sidewalk materials within the city of St. Pete are hex blocks that were uh, cast by the Farmer Concrete Company. A little hint to finding how old a neighborhood might be is every once in a while on the farmer concrete hex block, there's a date when it was cast. And that gives you a pretty good idea how old that neighborhood would be. So here we go into Mark Dixon Dodd's historic home. Um, and I'm going to just uh, talk about some of the neat features that you can find in each of those homes in Driftwood. First of all, as I said, he was an artist. He was actually a uh, uh, well-known throughout the country, and he provided a painting for each of the homes within Driftwood. And here over the fireplace, you see a Mark Dixon Dodd painting. Um, perhaps it's looking out over the waterfront at Driftwood. You can see sailboats kind of off in the bayou there. Um, 
Below the painting is the mantle and the fireplace. Another feature that you find in each of the Dodd homes is the fireplace. Uh, you will also see the woodworking. And so the paneling, uh, the cypress paneling that we have in this home, again, is found throughout the individual Dodd homes in the neighborhood, as well as the ceiling in this main room is not unusual for those homes. It's really, if you want to call it a beam or cathedral style ceiling. Um, so it offers a wonderful kind of feeling for this home, a warm feeling. Uh, you see it has large windows that look out onto the neighborhood. Another feature was the flooring in each of the homes. And so this home still has some of the original flooring. It looks like uh, almost tile flooring. It is scored concrete. Um, and you find that in a number of the homes as well. So this is a Mark Dixon Dodd driftwood home. It's a very special home. Uh, Lori McDonald is the homeowner and uh, Lori felt uh, so strongly about the home being special that a number of years ago she applied for a historic status for this home and this home is one of St. Petersburg's locally designated landmarks uh, in recognition of the uh, uh, of the multiple design facets that we've been talking about, the architectural styling, the design styling, um, the uniqueness of the neighborhood. Uh, and so just to go back, uh, Arthur Modine was actually uh, not a designer himself. He was an engineer. Uh, and uh, oddly enough, uh, his claim to fame otherwise was that he had designed uh, what would become the radiator for all the Model T cars. He teamed up with Henry Ford um, and uh, created what is called the fin radiator um, and uh, uh, provided the radiators for the F Ford Model T. He came down to St. Pete, created what's called the Bayview Construction Company, and uh, that brought us to Driftwood. Uh, so it's a neighborhood of winding roads. As I said, 19 homes were built uh, uh, from the mid 30s on into the late 30s, early 40s. And um, Construction then uh, more or less stopped for a period of time. World War II happened. And in the post-World War II era, the 1950s and 1960s, there was another spate of construction. Again, each of those homes was an individually designed, matching the scale of the original driftwood homes. So um, let's, uh, let's take a walk on back outside, uh, see a little bit more of of driftwood and find out a little bit more about the history uh, dating back before Arthur Modine bought the property. And I think Monica is going to uh, have a few yes. photos of some other parts of a driftwood and some of the Dodd homes that can be found in the neighborhood. All right, cool. Thanks, Peter. I'll show a couple of pictures while you're walking to your next stop. So first we have the driftwood sign that uh, is really just on kind of the backside of Lori's house that you were just at. There's a, another photo of it. I'm always surprised how many people have not been into Driftwood. And if you, if you go down by the Chataway, you'll know you're entering it when you see this great sign. Um, here's a picture of Mark Dixon Dodd. Peter, is that painting a self-portrait okay. by Mark Dixon Dodd? Peter, can you hear me? Yes. Is that painting a yes. self-portrait? Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to go show some of the others. So here's a 1938 Dodd home, uh, 2,000 square feet, minimal, traditional, with English traditional vernacular influences. And then we're going to go to the next one. Here's a 1936 Dodd home, an English vernacular revival. A 1938 Dodd home. This one's a little larger, 3,700 square feet, minimal, traditional, with strong English vernacular revival influence. Here's a 1938 Dodd home, about 1,700 square feet. Uh, I like this one. It's got this minimal traditional with English vernacular revival and whimsical storybook elements, which is fitting because it's the home of uh, Flora's poet laureate, Peter Meinke, and his wife, Jean, professor at Eckerd College. Uh, this is one of the later homes that Peter was talking about, built in 1973. It's a minimal traditional single story with a second story pop up. And Peter's going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the mix of the old and new in Driftwood and, and uh, how those places interact. So I'll turn it over to you, Scott. All right, great. Uh, here we are. We've just kind of walked across the street from uh, the Dodd home. 
And actually the neighborhood has a small uh, neighborhood beach. So there is a dedicated uh, walkway for each of the neighbors to use that leads down to the beach where we are right now. We look out across the bay. This is a big bayou that we're actually looking out on. Um, and then on out into Tampa Bay. Directly across from us on the other side of the bayou is what is known as Coquina Key. Um, and one of the things that is a bit unusual for the neighborhood today, you do not see seawalls in this neighborhood. So this is still a neighborhood with natural shoreline. Uh, so we have shoreline, we have mangroves uh, growing along the shore. Uh, so it's another little piece of uh, kind of that natural habitat and what ultimately was what I referred to as the designing with nature. So with that, let's talk about kind of what was the situation before Arthur Modine purchased the property in the 1930s. And um, there is history that goes way back. Uh, we're going to start with the early European history. And so in terms of Pinellas County, and at one time, Pinellas County was part of Hillsborough County. But for the purpose of our Pinellas Peninsula, European settlement started right here. Um, and so let's go back to the 1820s. And in the 1820s, uh, Pinellas is still largely, uh, if you want to say, uh, unpopulated. Over in Tampa, um, uh, the federal government built Fort Brook. Uh, that was in 1824. Uh, Fort Brook was built uh, to uh, make a, a, for a check on uh, the Seminole or Native American population that uh, the, the federal government was concerned was going to be growing in its presence. Um, and so Fort Brook was established uh, and uh, that largely kept uh, the spread of uh, the Seminoles from uh, happening in both the Hillsborough and Pinellas Peninsulas. So we have one of the first surveys here in, 18, in, in the 1840s. Um, the population around the fort in Tampa was slowly growing. And uh, there were just a handful of settlers here in Pinellas. Some of the names uh, might be familiar to a few of you. Uh, there was William Bunce. We have Bunce's Pass out on the beach. Uh, there was, um, uh, and then uh, William uh, or uh, William Bunce, as I said, Joe Silva, and uh, John Levick, and Maximo Hernandez. And so, on the south tip of uh, Saint Pete, we have Maximo Park. They're the original settlers, um, and. Uh, uh, as again, the couple decades go on, as we move into the, uh, the mid-century, the 1850s, uh, we have two groups of pioneers beginning to settle this area. Uh, we have the farmers and cattlemen from, uh, from the south, and they're known as the crackers and the conks. Uh, so uh, uh, the crackers and then the conks, and most of the conks were either from the Bahamas or had come over from Cuba. Um, most of the homesteading that was going on here was actually uh, homesteading in the sense of squatting. Uh, so uh, they were not given deeds to the property, they were squatting on the property. And so in 1860, we have the census. And in the 1860 census, there are 54 households identified on the Pinellas Peninsula, five of which we would consider within the city limits of St. Petersburg. And two of those five are the Miranda and the Bethel families. Um, and so uh, the Miranda homestead is essentially here in Driftwood. Uh, so as I said, this is the, the 1860 census, uh, Bethel Miranda are here in the 1850s. And again, uh, we soon have another piece of, uh, of our country's history, which is the Civil War. And so the only part of Civil War action that is seen in Pinellas, in what will be Pinellas County on the Pinellas Peninsula, happens here again, right here in what we will later identify as Driftwood. So those early settlers were identified as Confederate sympathizers. Uh, and actually there was a naval shelling of uh, the Miranda homestead here on the edge of Driftwood. 
Uh, and so um, that is the engagement for the Civil War here on the Pinellas Peninsula. Uh, so ultimately after the war ends, uh, uh, the Miranda and Bethel families return here um, and begin again farming. Uh, and eventually there's actually the first post office is established here. Uh, it's established in 1876, um, just on the edge of the Driftwood neighborhood. And it continues uh, to be the local post office for some 30 years into the early 1900s. Um, and so, as I said, we had the post office and then uh, Arthur Modine actually purchases his property here in Driftwood uh, from the Miranda family, or excuse me, he purchased what, what is known as the Bethel Homestead uh, in 1936 and begins his ideas about development. So it's a fascinating history. Um, and uh, there clearly is a Native American history that predates this uh, way back when. Uh, not unusual, there, are, uh, there were shell middens that were in this neighborhood. Um, that were ultimately used for other purposes. So there is a long history here to, uh, to Driftwood, uh, a very interesting history. Uh, if, if you have an interest in, in that history, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Driftwood Historic District application. It's well documented within that, doc, uh, within that application. So let's again let uh, Monica show us a few of the historic photos of uh, some of the ones with the Bethel and Miranda families. And we're gonna take a walk back into the neighborhood here away from the waterfront. Hey, Peter, I'm gonna um, make keep you big for a second because it was when you were walking out there, I want people to really be able to see where you're walking. So clarify okay. for me, this is um, communally owned, this part that okay. you're walking through right now, is that correct? Yes, so we're about to kind of leave the little beachhead, if you want to call it, which is the uh, public beach for the neighborhood. There is a little dock out there that's the neighborhood dock. I like to joke that off right here to my right is the neighborhood fleet, uh, the Driftwood Yacht Club. Uh, so there it is. Take your variety of colors. What's your favorite color for your kayak trip today? <laughs> Yellow, purple, blue, red, take your pick. And so the walkway then that we're going down just before we Kind of turn it back to Monica for the historic photos is a neighborhood uh, walkway and actually uh, uh, dedicated uh, within the uh, property records uh, that this is a neighborhood pathway uh, for use by neighborhood property owners. So Monica, you can maybe yeah, gonna bring up some up. of those historic photos then. We have one of our viewers, Peter, is asking, are there gators in Driftwood? Are there gators in Driftwood? Um, I, and I, I think not they mean that, alligators, not, not like the football team. <laughs> not that we typically see, but right where we were standing at the dock, uh, it is not unusual to see swimming and, uh, and, and uh, dolphins swimming in Big Bayou. Uh, so that's a great thing to do. And every once in a while, when you're out in the kayak, you might have a dolphin pop up right close to you. So um, I right. have not been seeing gators down here, but there's lots of wonderful uh, bird life as well. Uh, Peter, I have a picture of John Bethel when he was young and he's in his Civil War uniform because as you said, um, you know, there was that action there. He was a Confederate. And then I think the next photo we have of him is him as a, an elderly man. Um, if you are interested in St. Pete history, Bethel's history, he wrote a book about the early history of the Pinellas Peninsula, really what we know now as St. Pete. Um, and it's well worth reading. I've learned a lot as a tour guide myself from it. Um, here's a picture of John. At, he's over here on the right. That's the cursor there. Um, and his wife with their children on their porch at Big Bayou, which we now know as Driftwood, most of their children. And then here, I love this one. Um, Driftwood has always been, I think Peter will probably talk, can talk about the strong sense of community that's in Driftwood. Um, and you can see this dates back to really the late 1880s or the late 1800s when they would have big oyster roasts as a neighborhood. We can see, um, go back, John. We can see uh, John Bethel right here, the older man in the front. So they're having a, a oyster roast there. Um, this next one is the post office that you were talking about, Peter, circa 1880. And then here's the uh, drugstore that they had in, uh, really this was the first kind of town, if you will, that we had on the Pinellas Peninsula. 
uh, now what we now know as St. Pete. So that's it for the, oh, and then we got one more. Um, John Bethel is buried in Greenwood Cemetery on MLK right near Roser Park, um, along with a lot of our early, uh, our first early residents of the city. So great um, cemetery to go tour if you get the chance. Maybe we should do a tour of that. Back to you, Peter. All right, thank you, Monica. Uh, so we've just walked uh, maybe, uh, you know, 50 yards in, further into the Driftwood neighborhood. I'm actually facing the water that we were just looking out on. I don't see a gator, I don't see a dolphin, but I do see several pelicans uh, splashing in the water out there. Um, so, and, and actually we're looking across uh, an empty uh, lot. Monica, uh, before we end, I think we'll have a picture of the home that was there. It was actually Arthur Modine's home. It was the largest of the original uh, homes by, uh, by Parrish and, and Dodd. Uh, and unfortunately, the, uh, the neighborhood lost that home about a year ago. Um, and, uh, um, and there is one other historic home that the neighborhood lost uh, about two years ago, and that was known as the Gandhi home. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the name Gandhi from the Gandhi Bridge over to the Tampa. Um, and the Gandhi homestead, if you want to call it, was on the uh, far edge of Driftwood. It was actually built by, uh, by the grandson of John Williams. Uh, John Williams is known as one of the founders of St. Petersburg. So again, just another little kind of history tidbit uh, for here uh, in Driftwood. So uh, we're again here in the middle of the neighborhood. Uh, I'm standing on the edge of what uh, is actually a piece of Sydney Park land. Uh, we refer to it as Wildwood Circle. So we are on uh, what circles uh, the park here is Wildwood Lane, which again, I think is a very appropriate name for the neighborhood as well as Driftwood Road. Um, and so the homes that are behind me that we're kind of looking at, these are all among those original 19 Dodd homes that were placed around the circle. So uh, if we wanna just spend a minute talking about what's going on now with Driftwood, um, uh, the city of St. Pete uh, can allow neighborhoods to be designated as historic districts. We have several historic local historic districts here in St. Petersburg. Um, including in historic Kenwood, uh, within the old Northeast. Um, and so uh, there is an application which has uh, been made for Driftwood uh, and that application would result in local designation. Um, that essentially means that there would be an effort to maintain what is special with the neighborhood. Uh, historic designation has a review process before a home would be torn down, there would be a review process before someone would design either a new home or make substantial exterior changes to an existing historic home. Again, there's a review process. The idea is let's encourage keeping neighborhood character. Um, and so that process is ongoing. If you uh, happen to be on the Preserve the Berg website or get our e-news, you will probably see some news um, about that coming up. As I said, um, not only are there the historic Dodd in this neighborhood, uh, as I said at the start of our kind of trip here uh, through the neighborhood, uh, I am with Preserve the Berg, and I, you know, hope that we will see some of you at some of our events. We had a lot of fun last night at Movies in the Park. Uh, Movies in the Park has been an event that Preserve the Berg has done for 10 plus years now. It's started to celebrate our waterfront park system being 100 years old. So uh, uh, it's a little bit uh, different this year because of COVID, but we have one more chance for you to come down to a movie on Thursday, May 20th. We're going to be showing two weeks notice. So uh, uh, check out the, the Preserve the Berg website, uh, preservetheberg.org. Uh, and you can find out about the movies in the park. You can find out about the other issues that we are involved with uh, trying to keep St. Petersburg special. So we like to say that we educate, advocate, and celebrate uh, to keep St. Petersburg special. So let's uh, take our, our kind of final little uh, look around here at Driftwood. 
Um, it is one of many special neighborhoods that we have in St. Petersburg. I hope you've enjoyed our quick little tour here today. Um, and I thought it was fun that we had a chance to walk inside one of the homes. We're looking uh, kind of uh, directly at the home, which Monica had uh, mentioned that we have the state poet laureate, who is Peter Mikey. Um, I love the stories that he sometimes tell of his family growing up in this home. You can perhaps see that there are small decks up on the uh, second floor, right next to some of the large old oak trees. It was a wonderful opportunity for the kids to sneak out of the house at night as they were growing up here in the neighborhood. Um, in the uh, springtime, uh, the yard is beautiful because it's not a yard, as you can see, that is grass. It is a yard of azalea bushes. And so uh, in the springtime, we have a wonderful uh, kind of pink flowering azalea front yard here at Peter and his wife, Jean. She's a, uh, also a well-accomplished artist. The home immediately next door, we have talked about Mark Dixon Dodd primarily, but I had mentioned there was an architect, Archie Parrish, who was also involved with the design of the neighborhood. And uh, this is the Parrish home that is next door. The Parrish family actually owned it from the, uh, uh, from the late 1930s on up to just a couple years ago when the family sold it. It had remained for all those decades within uh, the Parrish family. Hey, so, Peter. Hey, Peter. Yes. Walk, walk down. You can see these houses really well. It's nice. If, when in a second I'm going to throw up those last couple of pictures but could you walk okay. down a little bit farther towards like the um the old Miranda homestead I don't know if they'll have time to get you all the way down there yeah but I wouldn't the, walk that way I don't think we're going to ha quite have time to get down there but no but it, um, it'll give everybody one, a better sense of the, of the we, neighborhood right one of the things we might might just get a, a glimpse of uh, and I think we have a, a picture of an old newspaper headline uh, the neighborhood is, is indeed a neighborhood of uh, people who are passionate about where they live. And in the 1970s, it was actually 1970, the neighborhood did not want the streets paved. Uh, part of the reason they didn't want the streets paved is there is a tree in the middle of Driftwood Road. And they were afraid that if the street was paved, uh, that the tree would be cut down. And so they actually went to court. Uh, the matter was eventually settled and resolved. Uh, the street is paved. The tree has remained. Uh, so uh, that was, a, 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 if you want to say, maybe a fun compromise. Um, and uh, about a year or two ago, there was a little neighborhood uproar because there was a note tacked to the tree. Uh, it said to call the city. And... Uh, uh, there, there was uh, some inspection and they thought maybe there was not enough space for fire and safety vehicles to travel through driftwood. And again, the neighborhood uh, said, no, we want our tree. Don't take it out of the road. Find another solution. It's worked for many decades. It can continue to work. So um, Peter, the tree what? remains in the middle of driftwood road. Can you... Um... I think you're almost to the, I, I wanted them to see some of the houses that are along the water. We saw you okay. go out to the water, but if you can get down to those. Um, Peter, we have a couple of questions right. that as we're wrapping up, I wanted you to answer our, that our viewers are asking. Do you have any, do you know why Google Maps doesn't show street view of the Driftwood streets? Has the Google car not come in there and taken video? I, I don't know. Sometimes it's, uh, as, as we make, see a little bit as we're walking through here. Some homes you can see, there are many homes that are more or less still hidden within the hammock and vegetation. And so when you say, for example, let's see some of the homes on the water, some of them again, this one that's just here to our left, we have a good view of the home, but others are really hidden uh, within uh, their own little kind of kind of world within driftwood. You can see that really well, though. That's that's what I was looking for. Um, Peter, are so there any, we make, go ahead. Are there any deed restrictions or anything that that requires that people keep their yards a certain way? How do you how do they keep that like amazing tree canopy? What about like the tree trimmers and the 
you know, for the phone uh, lines there, or the cable lines? There, uh, that's a good question because I think every year there is kind of uh, a call to arms to make sure that uh, Duke Energy or the cable companies do not remove the trees. Uh, and they've actually had a long ongoing series of conversations and have essentially worked that out with the uh, power company that uh, they know that uh, trees are important here in Driftwood. We should be able to just see in distance now the tree that's in the middle of the road. Uh, if we kind of get the camera on it. Um, so um, again, we have an oak tree growing up in the middle of the road um, and cars for decades have successfully passed by. So if we look off here to the right, it's an example. It's not real easy to see some of the homes that are tucked away. So we can see a bit of the home here. Um, and uh, uh, there's been lots of wonderful people who talented people who've lived in the neighborhood. So we're looking at the home where one of our wonderful local musicians lives, uh, uh, Rebecca Pulley and uh, Rob Pastori. Uh, so they're part of some of our local talent who decided they too wanted to have the Driftwood experience. Well, speaking of the people that live there, Somebody asked, do residents mind if people are walking through and just enjoying it's, the it's neighborhood? A pretty, it's actually a pretty common experience for people to yeah. see uh, somebody uh, walking or bicycling through Driftwood. So I think they're pretty much used to it right now, um, but uh, it makes a very pleasant walk through. So um, I'm sure some of our, uh, some, some might be interested in doing that. So hey, Peter, come on down. I I'm uh, just the last things I'm showing the uh, map of the local historic district with the yellow ones as contributing structures and the pink uh, squares as non contributing. Can you just quickly explain what the difference of that is? And then I'm going to um, I'm going to end on that newer home that's been built. But if you explain the difference. Okay, between contributing great. And um, so as a general rule of thumb uh, in the historic preservation world, um, a building needs to be at least 50 years old in order to be considered historic. Like any rule, there's some exceptions to that. Um, assuming that your building is at least 50 years old, then there will be a further review to see whether it has, for example, special architectural features. Is it associated with, uh, you know, uh, an important architect? Why else might the home have some historic significance? And ultimately, there's a determination made for an area that is looking at becoming an historic district as to whether the property is considered contributing or non-contributing. Um, and the idea is that the greater focus over time will be on those contributing properties. Those are the ones that retain some special significant significance to the neighborhood. And so those will have a bit more of a review in terms of potential changes than non-contributing properties. Um, and so that map that uh, Monica displayed shows the uh, significant and non-significant properties for the proposed historic district. I think the last photo that Monica has is again, to me says it all in the sense of why should a neighborhood care in becoming an historic district? And the simple answer is again, you know, character matters. And so that last slide is a home that is just down the street from the historic district boundary. Um, the home that was there was demolished several years ago. And uh, one of our local development companies built the new home there. And I think the picture kind of says it all uh, in terms of compare that to what we've been looking at here in Driftwood. And uh, um, that's the reason I think why people are passionate about this neighborhood. And I think that's a reason for, for why other neighborhoods should think about um, historic district designation. So we're probably so, about out of time. I don't we know. Are, we are, but hold one. on, Peter, answer one more question because I okay. showed the pictures of the Gandhi home uh, and the, the, um, the other home that was demolished, the 1937 Dodd home. Um, can you explain why that home and the the Gandhi home were demolished recently? Well, the two homes were demolished um, and uh, there was not any type of, I'm gonna say historic review uh, for the Gandhi home. It was not a designated historic property, although it had a great deal of historic significance. Um, regarding the Gandhi home, unfortunately uh, the family uh, 
uh, one of the Gandhi family members had lived in the home for decades. She, you know, had finally aged and eventually uh, did pass away. Uh, the remaining family members decided that they would sell the property and that property was sold. And so the new property owner made a determination that they desired to build a new home and that new home is under construction today. And I, it seems like a, a shame to have lost all that history in that, that building. Um, Peter, we are, we're only six minutes over. So I'm impressed with the two of us that we managed to keep it on time. And uh, there's one more thing we have to say before we sign off. And that is a big happy birthday to you. You almost uh, snuck out without uh, us knowing it was your birthday, but Lori texted me. So happy birthday. And, thank uh, you. Thanks, thanks for guest I'm, starring. I'm really, only, I'm really only 23, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, as we all, yeah. as we all are. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Peter, okay. thanks for guest starring with uh, I Love the Berg and joining us on behalf of Preserve the Berg. Um, and I'll, I'll sign off for, uh, for I Love the Berg. I'm Monica Kyle. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. It was fun. All right.